Hi folks, this is Andy, the Analytical Preacher. Our question for today's podcast, are there still demons traversing the earth and or more relevant perhaps, is demon possession still possible today? Does human possession by demons still happen in today's world? This is one of those areas where the Bible maybe doesn't speak as clearly as we would like it to. Of course, it's fine to have opinions. We just need to be honest and say, these are the scriptures that are relevant. This is the direction they point us. Therefore, this is the opinion I draw from that. And that's essentially how we're going to do this podcast today. I will mention a few things that we definitely know about the situation. And then I'll explain to you how I reach my opinion based on scripture for the things that aren't made as clear to us. When we look at the Old Testament, we really don't see demon possession discussed. It appears that, and and honestly, even in the New Testament, once you get through the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you get through the first portion of the book of Acts, you really don't see demon possession mentioned there either. And so it appears that demon possession occurred for a short period of time as a way for Christ and his apostles to authenticate themselves as true messengers of God. As I mentioned in other podcasts, God typically authenticated his messengers one of two ways. Either they made far off prophecies, which ultimately came true and authenticated the fact that they must have been speaking for God, or they were able to perform miracles of some description, which even for those who were alive in the moment, but wouldn't be alive when the prophecies were fulfilled, could clearly see meant that they were a prophet from God. And this idea of curing someone of a demon possession, exercising someone of a demon appears to be one of the ways that God intended for Jesus and his apostles to be authenticated. The closest thing you get in the Old Testament is the recounting of King Saul being tormented by an evil spirit. The way that's written, it just doesn't appear to be possession by a demon, certainly not demon possession the way that it was in the time of Christ. And so I think it's safe to say in the Old Testament, we didn't see it. And in the latter parts of the New Testament writings, it's not brought up as being an issue either. So it appears to have been just in this one period of time, if that is the case, and it was used primarily, or as I would argue, exclusively to authenticate Jesus and his apostles, then we would expect, whether we were explicitly told in Scripture or not, we would expect that demon possession would have disappeared either at the time of Christ or would have disappeared by the time all of his apostles had left the earth. Now, here's what we do know for sure. There was demon and demon possession, and Christ and his apostles were able to exercise those demons because the Bible says that that is the case. And we also know for sure that even if there was demon possession today, the Bible does not instruct us how we should address the issue, how we should approach the problem. So we all think when we think demon possession, we think about these Hollywood movies and these Catholic priests that have these exorcism rites. Those are not biblical. Those would not work because they have not been uh, ordained or commissioned by God, if you will. The best thing that we could do if we thought someone were demon possessed, if we felt we were dealing with demonic forces today, the best thing that we could do is pray and pray to God to rebuke those demons in his name and his power. We we read in Jude's letter, Jude was one of Jesus' half-brothers. Jude writes something in, in verse 9 of his letter. He says, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was cons- was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. And that's really... All we could do today would be to say, God, heal this person. The Lord rebuke this force that's tormenting this individual. Again, I don't see that happening. There's no clear evidence at all to me that this is happening in any way in today's world. We know, of course, that as Christians, that as believers, it would be impossible for us to be demon-possessed because we have been gifted and sealed by the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to read all these verses, but if for reference, if you want to look them up, 
Uh, Acts 2.38, Peter promises that those who repent and are baptized will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21 and 22. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And on and on I could go. This idea that we have the gift of the Spirit inside of us, even that we have been sealed by God with the Holy Spirit. And so it would not be possible for a Christian to be possessed by a demon, obviously, as the Holy Spirit is God, is one of the three persons of God, and would clearly have the power to prevent that from happening. But I don't see it happening in non-Christians either. It appears to me that there are a couple of verses in the Bible. One is an Old Testament prophecy by Zechariah, which I will read in a second. Another is a New Testament verse written by Paul, but which quotes a psalm from the Old Testament. And it appears to me that these two verses are essentially saying the way that I interpret them, are saying this idea of demons and demon possession is going to fade out in the New Testament era, much like other things, much like the ability to heal someone by laying on of hands or the ability to speak in tongues. Those things have faded out in the New Testament era, just as the Apostle Paul told us they would, where there are tongues they will cease and where there are miracles they will stop. And it appears to me there's two verses that say this idea of demon and demon possessions would fade away in the New Testament era as well. Zechariah, which is near the back of the Old Testament, is one of the most fascinating prophets. Zechariah was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to write down various prophecies. And a lot of them had to do with Jesus Christ and his work. And a lot of them had to do with times in the future, far removed from when Zechariah was writing. And one of the things that he writes in Zechariah 13, so you read Zechariah 12, You see this idea of the Christ and his wounds and the work that he's going to do. And then Zechariah 13, just the first two verses, open this way. On that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. And I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. Now, some say this is nothing more than saying when Christ dies, when Christ has made a payment for our sins, the fountain will be opened that allows followers of God, in this case through Jesus Christ, to be cleansed from their sin and that God is then going to remove these false prophets who have this unclean spirit about them. And the verses 3 and 4 go on to speak a little bit more about false prophets and how even their own parents would turn against them, etc. Another way to read this, and again, if you look at Old Testament scholars, whether they're Hebrew Old Testament scholars or whether they are Christian Old Testament scholars, They're split on this. Some Old Testament scholars read the verse this way, which is that the prophets that would be removed is is ultimately saying once Christ is resurrected, his immediate apostles will still be inspired of God to write the New Testament, and then they will go away. Once that fountain is open and the church is being built and they're being cleansed from their sin, that the prophets will ultimately be removed. And so today I would say no one is receiving communication from God through the Holy Spirit that allows them to write scripture that is equal in authority to what we find in the Bible. The prophets have been removed from the land. And this spirit of uncleanness then is not this unclean spirit in the false prophets. The prophets were true prophets but they're just being taken off the scene. They're no longer needed. Once the Bible is completely written in its final form, as it has been, we don't need prophets to continue to add additional words to the scripture. They're removed from the land. And this spirit of uncleanness, these demon forces that have been unleashed so that Christ and the prophets could authenticate themselves if we're no longer going to need prophets because the Bible is going to be complete 
then we would no longer need to authenticate prophets. And so this idea of spirit of uncleanness, though it is in the singular there, I will admit, seems to be referencing, could possibly be referencing the fact that when Christ has paid for sin and has resurrected back to the Father, the era of prophets writing the New Testament and demons traversing the earth looking for people to possess, both of those things will ultimately be removed from the land. The New Testament verse I mentioned is in Ephesians chapter 4. And it's not really the purpose of this verse, but Paul says in Ephesians 4, 8, or it's not the purpose of this section of Ephesians 4. Paul says Ephesians 4, 8, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In this verse, Paul is quoting and restructuring a little bit from Psalm 68, specifically Psalm 68, verse 18. Psalm 68, this verse 18 especially, which I'll read in just a second, it's speaking about God defeating his enemies. And as was the custom, and it was the custom for centuries and centuries and centuries, as was the custom, God as the victorious warrior in defeating his enemies would lead a train of captive prisoners of war back to the capital city. And as he victoriously leads this train of captive prisoners of war to show I have conquered these individuals and have drugged them back with me as proof, then he is given gifts by the people as the great victor. That verse in Psalm 68 reads this way. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. This is saying, God, you will ultimately win. You will lead the host of captives back to your capital city. You will get gifts, showered by, uh, with gifts from the people because you are victorious forever. And even those who are rebellious against you ultimately won't be able to stop you from doing what you intend to do. Paul is quoting this, and his primary purpose is to speak about the gifts. So what Paul is saying is, yes, the psalm spoke about God going and being showered with gifts by his citizens. But Jesus, in his great mercy, when he ascended back to heaven, he actually gave us gifts. And then he goes on, starting in verse 11, to speak about the gifts of evangelists and pastors and teachers to build up the church and help all the Christian people who will ultimately be part of the church. But what Paul is saying is, let me quote this verse. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. Paul didn't take that part out. He leaves that part in and just says, instead of just us giving our gifts of worship and tithes and offerings to Jesus' church, he also gave gifts to men, pastors and teachers and the church itself, etc. So, of course, the question is then, what is this host of captives? Who are these prisoners of war that the victorious Christ has led in his train as he goes on high? And again, scholars are split. Some scholars would make the argument, I would agree with this argument, that what this is is the defeated Demons, the defeated demonic spirits are being led away from the battleground of earth because Christ has now secured that area and he is primarily leading or leading most of these spirits away in his train of captives, in his train of prisoners of war as the victorious general in the fight. So if that view of Zechariah and if that view of Psalm 68 and that view of Ephesians 4, 8 are correct, then we would simply say there really are no demons left today as the prophets slowly one by one were either martyred for their faith or as we think the apostle John did just died of natural causes in old age. As the prophets one by one left the scene, we saw things like the miracles needed to authenticate their apostleship also leave the scene. It appears that when Christ opened the fountain for our cleansing at his death and resurrection, that one of the things he also began was the removal of the unclean spirit from the land. And that it began when he led a whole host of those captives up with him 
as he ascended victoriously into heaven. And if we interpret those scriptures that way, then the answer to our question, is there demon possession of humans on the earth today? We would say, no, there is not, which is why the Bible does not tell us how we should address that issue were we to encounter it. If you hold a different opinion, I believe it. there is a heavy burden of proof that you need to present. You need to show scriptures that say demons existed before Christ and that they continue to exist even after the apostles had stopped doing their work, had ceased to need authentication because all the scriptures had been written. And I think you need to provide a compelling explanation for Zechariah 13, Psalm 68, and Ephesians 4, 8 as well. Having studied it and having read those, the proponents on both ends of that scale, I am fairly convinced that the right answer is there are no demons and there is no demon possession still on the earth today. That's my opinion on the matter. You certainly may hold a different opinion as long as you honestly pull it from the scriptures. In either case, thanks for listening. This is Andy.